Chapter 9 of The New Physics and Its Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in October 2016. The New Physics and Its Evolution by Lucien Poincare. Chapter 9, Part 1 Cathode Rays and Radioactive Bodies. Paragraph 1. The Cathode Rays A wire traversed by an electric current is, as has just been explained, the seat of a movement of electrons. If we cut this wire, a flood of electrons, like a current of water, which, at the point where a pipe bursts, flows out in abundance, will appear to spring out between the two ends of the break. If the energy of the electrons is sufficient, these electrons will in fact rush forth and be propagated in the air or in the insulating medium interposed, but the phenomena of the discharge will in general be very complex. We shall here only examine a particularly simple case, that is, that of the cathode rays, and without entering into details, we shall only note the results relating to these rays, which furnish valuable arguments in favor of the electronic hypothesis and supply solid materials for the construction of new theories of electricity and matter. For a long time it was noticed that the phenomena in a Geissler tube changed their aspect considerably when the gas pressure became very weak without, however, a complete vacuum being formed. From the cathode there is shot forth normally and in a straight line a flood within the tube, dark but capable of impressing a photographic plate, of developing the fluorescence of various substances, particularly the glass walls of the tube, and of producing calorific and mechanical effects. These are the cathode rays, so named in 1883 by E. Wiedemann, and their name, which was unknown to a great number of physicists till barely twelve years ago, has become popular at the present day. About 1869, Hittorf made an already very complete study of them and put in evidence their principal properties, but it was the researches of Sir W. Crookes in especial which drew attention to them. The celebrated physicist foresaw that the phenomena which were thus produced in rarefied gases were, in spite of their very great complication, more simple than those presented by matter under the condition in which it is generally met with. He devised a celebrated theory no longer admissible in its entirety, because it is not in complete accord with the facts, which was, however, very interesting, and contained, in germ, certain of our present ideas. In the opinion of Crookes, in a tube in which the gas has been rarefied, we are in presence of a special state of matter. The number of the gas molecules has become small enough for their independence to be almost absolute, and they are able in this so-called radiant state to traverse long spaces without departing from a straight line. The cathode rays are due to a kind of molecular bombardment of the walls of the tubes, and of the screens which can be introduced into them, and it is the molecules, electrified by their contact with the cathode and then forcibly repelled by electrostatic action, which produce, by their movement and their vis viva, all the phenomena observed. Moreover, these electrified molecules animated with extremely rapid velocities correspond, according to the theory verified in the celebrated experiment of Rowland on convection currents, to a true electric current, and can be deviated by a magnet. Notwithstanding the success of Crookes experiments, many physicists, the Germans especially, did not abandon an hypothesis entirely different from that of radiant matter. They continued to regard the cathode radiation as due to particular radiations of a nature still little known, but produced in the luminous ether. This interpretation seemed indeed, in 1894, destined to triumph definitely through the remarkable discovery of Lenard, a discovery which, in its turn, was to provoke so many others and to bring about consequences of which the importance seems every day more considerable. 
Professor Lenard's fundamental idea was to study the cathode rays under conditions different from those in which they are produced. These rays are born in a very rarefied space, under conditions perfectly determined by Sir W. Crookes, but it was a question whether, when once produced, they would be capable of propagating themselves in other media, such as a gas at ordinary pressure, or even in an absolute vacuum. Experiment alone could answer this question, but there were difficulties in the way of this which seemed almost insurmountable. The rays are stopped by glass even of slight thickness, and how then could the almost vacuous space in which they have to come into existence be separated from the space, absolutely vacuous or filled with gas, into which it was desired to bring them? The artifice used was suggested to Professor Lenard by an experiment of Hertz. The great physicist had, in fact, shortly before his premature death, taken up this important question of the cathode rays, and his genius left there, as elsewhere, its powerful impress. He had shown that metallic plates of very slight thickness were transparent to the cathode rays, and Professor Lenard succeeded in obtaining plates impermeable to air, but which yet allowed the pencil of cathode rays to pass through them. Now, if we take a crook's tube with the extremity hermetically closed by a metallic plate, with a slit across the diameter of one millimetre in width, and stop this slit with a sheet of very thin aluminium, it will be immediately noticed that the rays pass through the aluminium and pass outside the tube. They are propagated in air at atmospheric pressure, and they can also penetrate into an absolute vacuum. They therefore can no longer be attributed to radiant matter, and we are led to think that the energy brought into play in this phenomenon must have its seat in the light-bearing ether itself. But it is a very strange light which is thus subject to magnetic action, which does not obey the principle of equal angles, and for which the most various gases are already disturbed media. According to Crookes, it possesses also the singular property of carrying with it electric charges. This convection of negative electricity by the cathode rays seems quite inexplicable on the hypothesis that the rays are ethereal radiations. Nothing then remained in order to maintain this hypothesis, except to deny the convection, which, besides, was only established by indirect experiments. That the reality of this transport has been placed beyond dispute by means of an extremely elegant experiment, which is all the more convincing that it is so very simple, is due to M. Perrin. In the interior of a crook's tube he collected a pencil of cathode rays in a metal cylinder. According to the elementary principles of electricity, the cylinder must become charged with the whole charge, if there be one, brought to it by the rays, and naturally various precautions had to be taken. But the result was very precise, and doubt could no longer exist. The rays were electrified. It might have been, and indeed was, maintained some time after this experiment was published, that while the phenomena were complex inside the tube, outside things might perhaps occur differently. Lenard himself, however, with that absence of even involuntary prejudice common to all great minds, undertook to demonstrate that the opinion he had first held could no longer be accepted, and succeeded in repeating the experiment of M. Perrin on cathode rays in the air and even in vacuo. On the wrecks of the two contradictory hypotheses thus destroyed, and out of the materials from which they had been built, a theory has been constructed which coordinates all the known facts. This theory is furthermore closely allied to the theory of ionization, and, like this letter, is based on the concept of the electron. Cathode rays are electrons in rapid motion. The phenomena produced both inside and outside a Crookes tube are, however, generally complex. In Lenard's first experiments, and in many others effected later, when this region of physics was still very little known, a few confusions may be noticed even at the present day. At the spot where the cathode rays strike the walls of the tube, the essentially different X-rays appear. 
These differ from the cathode radiations by being neither electrified nor deviated by a magnet. In their turn, these X-rays may give birth to the secondary rays of Monsieur Sagnac, and often we find ourselves in presence of effects from these last-named radiations and not from the true cathode rays. The electrons, when they are propagated in a gas, can ionize the molecules of this gas and unite with the neutral atoms to form negative ions, while positive ions also appear. There are likewise produced, at the expense of the gas still subsisting after rarefication within the tube, positive ions which, attracted by the cathode and reaching it, are not all neutralized by the negative electrons, and can, if the cathode be perforated, pass through it, and if not, pass round it. We have then what are called the canal rays of Goldstein, which are deviated by an electric or magnetic field in a contrary direction to the cathode rays, but, being larger, give weak deviations or may even remain undeviated through losing their charge when passing through the cathode. It may also be the parts of the walls at a distance from the cathode which send a positive rush to the latter by a similar mechanism. It may be, again, that in certain regions of the tube, cathode rays are met with diffused by some solid object, and without having thereby changed their nature. All these complexities have been cleared up by M. Villard, who has published on these questions some remarkable ingenious and particularly careful experiments. M. Villard has also studied the phenomena of the coiling of the rays in a field, as already pointed out by Hitorf and Plücker. When a magnetic field acts on the cathode particle, the latter follows a trajectory, generally helicoidal, which is anticipated by the theory. We here have to do with a question of ballistics, and experiments duly confirm the anticipations of the calculation. Nevertheless, rather singular phenomena appear in the case of certain values of the field, and these phenomena, dimly seen by Plücker and Birkeland, have been the object of experiments by M. Villard. The two faces of the cathode seem to emit rays which are deviated in a direction perpendicular to the lines of force by an electric field, and do not seem to be electrified. M. Villard calls them magneto-cathode rays, and according to M. Fortin, these rays may be ordinary cathode rays, but of very slight velocity. In certain cases, the cathode itself may be superficially disaggregated, and extremely tenuous particles detach themselves, which, being carried off at right angles to its surface, may deposit themselves like a very thin film on objects placed in their path. Various physicists, among them M. Welvig, have studied this phenomenon, and in the case of pressures between 1 over 20 and 1 over 100 of a millimeter, the last named scholar has obtained mirrors of most metals, a phenomenon he designates by the name of ionoplasty. But in spite of all these accessory phenomena, which even sometimes conceal those first observed, the existence of the electron in the cathodic flux remains the essential characteristic. The electron can be apprehended in the cathodic ray by the study of its essential properties, and J. J. Thomson gave great value to the hypothesis by his measurements. At first he meant to determine the speed of the cathode rays by direct experiment, and by observing, in a revolving mirror, the relative displacement of two bands due to the excitement of two fluorescent screens placed at different distances from the cathode but he soon perceived that the effect of the fluorescence was not instantaneous, and that the lapse of time might form a great source of error, and he then had recourse to indirect methods. It is possible, by a simple calculation, to estimate the deviations produced on the rays by a magnetic and an electric field respectively as a function of the speed of propagation, and of the relation of the charge to the material mass of the electron. The measurement of these deviations will then permit this speed and this relation to be ascertained. Other processes may be used which all give the same two quantities by two suitably chosen measurements. 
such are the radius of the curve taken by the trajectory of the pencil in a perpendicular magnetic field, and the measure of the fall of potential under which the discharge takes place, or the measure of the total quantity of electricity carried in one second, and the measure of the calorific energy which may be given, during the same period, to a thermoelectric junction. The results agree as well as can be expected having regard to the difficulty of the experiments. The values of the speed agree also with those which Professor Wiechert has obtained by direct measurement. The speed never depends on the nature of the gas contained in the Crookes tube, but varies with the value of the fall of potential at the cathode. It is of the order of one-tenth of the speed of light, and it may rise as high as one-third. The cathode particle therefore goes about 3,000 times faster than the Earth in its orbit. The relation is also invariable, even when the substance of which the cathode is formed is changed, or one gas is substituted for another. It is, on the average, a thousand times greater than the corresponding relation in electrolysis. As experiment has shown in all the circumstances where it has been possible to effect measurements, the equality of the charges carried by all corpuscles, ions, atoms, etc., we ought to consider that the charge of the electron is here, again, that of a univalent ion in electrolysis, and therefore that its mass is only a small fraction of that of the atom of hydrogen, that is, of the order of about a thousandth part. This is the same result as that to which we were led by the study of flames. The thorough examination of the cathode radiation, then, confirms us in the idea that every material atom can be dissociated and will yield an electron much smaller than itself, and always identical, whatever the matter whence it comes, the rest of the atom remaining charged with a positive quantity equal and contrary to that borne by the electron. In the present case, these positive ions are no doubt those that we again meet with in the canal rays. Professor Wien has shown that their mass is really, in fact, of the order of the mass of atoms. Although they are all formed of identical electrons, there may be various cathode rays, because the velocity is not exactly the same for all electrons. Thus is explained the fact that we can separate them, and that we can produce a sort of spectrum by the action of the magnet. Or, again, as M. Delandre has shown in a very interesting experiment, by that of an electrostatic field. This also probably explains the phenomena studied by M. Villard and previously pointed out. Paragraph 2. Radioactive Substances even in ordinary conditions, certain substances called radioactive emit, quite outside any particular reaction, radiations complex indeed, but which pass through fairly thin layers of minerals, impress photographic plates, excite fluorescence, and ionize gases. In these radiations we again find electrons which thus escape spontaneously from radioactive bodies. It is not necessary to give here a history of the discovery of radium, for everyone knows the admirable researches of Monsieur and Madame Curie. But subsequent to these first studies, a great number of facts have accumulated for the last six years, among which some people find themselves a little lost. It may, perhaps, not be useless to indicate the essential results actually obtained. The researches on radioactive substances have their starting point in the discovery of the rays of uranium made by M. Becquerel in 1896. As early as 1867, Nieps de Saint-Victor proved that salts of uranium impressed photographic plates in the dark. But at that time the phenomenon could only pass for a singularity, attributable to phosphorescence, and the valuable remarks of Nieps fell into oblivion. M. Becquerel established, after some hesitations natural in the face of phenomena which seemed so contrary to accepted ideas, that the radiating property was absolutely independent of phosphorescence, that all the salts of uranium, even the uranus salts which are not phosphorescent, give similar radiant effects, 
and that these phenomena correspond to a continuous emission of energy, but do not seem to be the result of a storage of energy under the influence of some external radiation. Spontaneous and constant, the radiation is insensible to variations of temperature and light. The nature of these radiations was not immediately understood, and their properties seemed contradictory. This was because we were not dealing with a single category of rays. But amongst all the effects there is one which constitutes for the radiations taken as a whole, a veritable process for the measurement of radioactivity. This is their ionizing action on gases. A very complete study of the conductivity of air under the influence of rays of uranium has been made by various physicists, particularly by Professor Rutherford, and has shown that the laws of the phenomenon are the same as those of the ionization due to the action of the Röntgen rays. It was natural to ask oneself if the property discovered in salts of uranium was peculiar to this body, or if it were not, to a more or less degree, a general property of matter. Madame Curie and M. Schmidt, independently of each other, made systematic researches in order to solve the question. Various compounds of nearly all the simple bodies at present known were thus passed in review, and it was established that radioactivity was particularly perceptible in the compounds of uranium and thorium, and that it was an atomic property linked to the matter endowed with it, and following it in all its combinations. In the course of her researches, Madame Curie observed that certain pitch blends, oxide of uranium ore, containing also barium, bismuth, etc., were four times more active, activity being measured by the phenomenon of the ionization of the air, than metallic uranium. Now, no compound containing any other active metal than uranium or thorium ought to show itself more active than those metals themselves, since the property belongs to their atoms. It seemed, therefore, probable that there existed in pitch blends some substance yet unknown, in small quantities and more radioactive than uranium. Monsieur and Madame Curie then commenced those celebrated experiments which brought them to the discovery of radium. Their method of research has been justly compared in originality and importance to the process of spectrum analysis. To isolate a radioactive substance, the first thing is to measure the activity of a certain compound suspected of containing this substance, and this compound is chemically separated. We then again take in hand all the products obtained, and by measuring their activity anew, it is ascertained whether the substance sought for has remained in one of these products, or is divided among them, and if so, in what proportion. The spectroscopic reaction which we may use in the course of this separation is a thousand times less sensitive than observation of the activity by means of the electrometer. Though the principle on which the operation of the concentration of the radium rests is admirable in its simplicity, its application is nevertheless very laborious. Tons of uranium residues have to be treated in order to obtain a few decigrams of pure salts of radium. Radium is characterized by a special spectrum, and its atomic weight, as determined by Madame Curie, is 225. It is consequently the higher homologue of barium in one of the groups of Mendeleev. Salts of radium have in general the same chemical properties as the corresponding salts of barium, but are distinguished from them by the differences of solubility which allow of their separation and by their enormous activity, which is about a hundred thousand times greater than that of uranium. Radium produces various chemical and some very intense physiological reactions. Its salts are luminous in the dark, but this luminosity, at first very bright, gradually diminishes as the salts get older. We have here to do with a secondary reaction correlative to the production of the emanation, after which radium undergoes the transformations which will be studied later on. The method of analysis founded by Monsieur and Madame Curie has enabled other bodies presenting sensible radioactivity to be discovered. The alkaline metals appear to possess this property in a slight degree. Recently fallen snow and mineral waters manifest marked action. 
The phenomenon may often be due, however, to a radioactivity induced by radiations already existing in the atmosphere. But this radioactivity hardly attains the ten thousandth part of that presented by uranium, or the ten millionth of that appertaining to radium. Two other bodies, polonium and actinium, the one characterized by the special nature of the radiations it emits, and the other by a particular spectrum, seem likewise to exist in pitchblende. These chemical properties have not yet been perfectly defined. Thus, M. de Bierne, who discovered actinium, has been able to note the active property which seems to belong to it, sometimes in lanthanum, sometimes in neodymium. It is proved that all extremely radioactive bodies are the seat of incessant transformations, and even now we cannot state the conditions under which they present themselves in a strictly determined form. End of chapter 9, part 1chapter nine of the new physics and its evolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by avai in november two thousand sixteen the new physics and its evolution by lucien poincare chapter nine part two three the radiation of the radioactive bodies and the emanation to acquire exact notions as to the nature of the rays emitted by the radioactive bodies it was necessary to try to cause magnetic or electric forces to act on them so as to see whether they behaved in the same way as light and the x-rays or whether like the cathode rays they were deviated by a magnetic field this work was effected by professor giesel then by M. Becquerel, Professor Rutherford, and by many other experimenters after them. All the methods which have already been mentioned in principle have been employed in order to discover whether they were electrified, and, if so, by electricity of what sign, to measure their speed, and to ascertain their degree of penetration. The general result has been to distinguish three sorts of radiations, designated by the letters alpha, beta, gamma. The alpha rays are positively charged and are projected at a speed which may attain the tenth of that of light. M. Henri Becquerel has shown by the aid of photography that they are deviated by a magnet, and Professor Rutherford has, on his side, studied this deviation by the electrical method. The relation of the charge to the mass is, in the case of these rays, of the same order as in that of the ions of electrolysis. They may therefore be considered as exactly analogous to the canal rays of Goldstein, and we may attribute them to a material transport of corpuscles of the magnitude of atoms. The relatively considerable size of these corpuscles renders them very absorbable. A flight of a few millimetres in a gas suffices to reduce their number by one half. They have great ionizing power. The beta rays are on all points similar to the cathode rays. They are, as Monsieur and Madame Curie have shown, negatively charged, and the charge they carry is always the same. Their size is that of the electrons, and their velocity is generally greater than that of the cathode rays while it may become almost that of light. They have about a hundred times less ionizing power than the alpha rays. The gamma rays were discovered by M. Villard. They may be compared to the X-rays. Like the latter, they are not deviated by the magnetic field and are also extremely penetrating. A strip of aluminium five millimeters thick will stop the other kinds, but will allow them to pass. On the other hand, their ionizing power is 10,000 times less than that of the alpha rays. To these radiations, there sometimes are added in the course of experiments secondary radiations analogous to those of M. Sagnac, and produced when the alpha, beta, or gamma rays meet various substances. This complication has often led to some errors of observation. 
phosphorescence and fluorescence seem especially to result from the alpha and beta rays particularly from the alpha rays to which belongs the most important part of the total energy of the radiation sir w crookes has invented a curious little apparatus the sphintheriscope which enables us to examine the phosphorescence of the blend excited by these rays by means of a magnifying glass a screen covered with sulphide of zinc is kept under observation and in front of it is disposed at a distance of about half a millimetre a fragment of some salt of radium we then perceive multitudes of brilliant points on the screen which appear and at once disappear producing a scintillating effect it seems probable that every particle falling on the screen produces by its impact a disturbance in the neighbouring region and it is this disturbance which the eye perceives as a luminous point thus says sir w crookes each drop of rain falling on the surface of still water is not perceived as a drop of rain but by reason of the slight splash which it causes at the moment of impact and which is manifested by ridges and waves spreading themselves in circles the various radioactive substances do not all give radiations of identical constitution radium and thorium possess in somewhat large proportions the three kinds of rays and it is the same with actinium polonium contains especially alpha rays and a few gamma rays in the case of uranium the alpha rays have extremely slight penetrating power and cannot even impress photographic plates but the widest difference between the substances proceeds from the emanation radium in addition to the three groups of rays alpha beta and gamma disengages continuously an extremely subtle emanation seemingly almost imponderable but which may be for many reasons looked upon as a vapour of which the elastic force is extremely feeble monsieur and madame curie discovered as early as eighteen ninety nine that every substance placed in the neighbourhood of radium itself acquired a radioactivity which persisted for several hours after the removal of the radium this induced radioactivity seems to be carried to other bodies by the intermediary of a gas it goes round obstacles but there must exist between the radium and the substance a free and continuous space for the activation to take place it cannot for instance do so through a wall of glass in the case of compounds of thorium professor rutherford discovered a similar phenomenon since then various physicists professor soddy miss brooks miss gates monsieur dunn and others have studied the properties of these emanations the substance emanated can neither be weighed nor can its elastic force be ascertained but its transformations may be followed as it is luminous and it is even more certainly characterized by its essential property that is its radioactivity we also see that it can be decanted like a gas that it will divide itself between two tubes of different capacity in obedience to the law of marriott and will condense in a refrigerated tube in accordance with the principle of watt while it even complies with the law of gay lussac the activity of the emanation vanishes quickly and at the end of four days it has diminished by one half if a salt of radium is heated the emanation becomes more abundant and the residue which however does not sensibly diminish in weight will have lost all its radioactivity and will only recover it by degrees professor rutherford notwithstanding many different attempts has been unable to make this emanation enter into any chemical reaction if it be a gaseous body it must form part of the argon group and like its other members be perfectly inert by studying the spectrum of the gas disengaged by a solution of salt of radium sir william ramsay and professor soddy remarked that when the gas is radioactive there are first obtained rays of gases belonging to the argon family then by degrees as the activity disappears the spectrum slowly changes 
and finally presents the characteristic aspect of helium. We know that the existence of this gas was first discovered by spectrum analysis in the sun. Later its presence was noted in our atmosphere and in a few minerals which happen to be the very ones from which radium has been obtained. It might therefore have been the case that it pre-existed in the gases extracted from radium, but a remarkable experiment by M. Curie and Sir James Dewar seems to show convincingly that this cannot be so. The spectrum of helium never appears at first in the gas proceeding from pure bromide of radium, but it shows itself, on the other hand, very distinctly after the radioactive transformations undergone by the salt. All these strange phenomena suggest bold hypotheses, but to construct them with any solidity, they must be supported by the greatest possible number of facts. Before admitting a definite explanation of the phenomena which have their seat in the curious substances discovered by them, Monsieur and Madame Curie considered, with a great deal of reason, that they ought first to enrich our knowledge with the exact and precise facts relating to these bodies and to the effects produced by the radiations they emit. Thus, M. Curie particularly set himself to study the manner in which the radioactivity of the emanation is dissipated, and the radioactivity that this emanation can induce on all bodies. The radioactivity of the emanation diminishes in accordance with an exponential law. The constant of time which characterizes this decrease is easily and exactly determined, and has a fixed value, independent of the conditions of the experiment, as well as of the nature of the gas which is in contact with the radium and becomes charged with the emanation. The regularity of this phenomenon is so great that it can be used to measure time. In 3,985 seconds, the activity is always reduced one-half. Radioactivity induced on any body which has been for a long time in presence of a salt of radium disappears more rapidly. The phenomenon appears, moreover, more complex, and the formula which expresses the manner in which the activity diminishes must contain two exponentials. To find it theoretically, we have to imagine that the emanation first deposits on the body in question a substance which is destroyed in giving birth to a second this latter disappearing in its turn by generating a third. The initial and final substances would be radioactive, but the intermediary one not. If, moreover, the bodies acted on are brought to a temperature of over 700 degrees, they appear to lose by volatilization certain substances condensed in them, and at the same time their activity disappears. The other radioactive bodies behave in a similar way. Bodies which contain actinium are particularly rich in emanations. Uranium, on the contrary, has none. This body, nevertheless, is the seat of transformations comparable to those which the study of emanations reveals in radium. Sir W. Crookes has separated from uranium a matter which is now called uranium X. This matter is at first much more active than its parent, but its activity diminishes rapidly, while the ordinary uranium, which at the time of the separation loses its activity, regains it by degrees. In the same way, Professors Rutherford and Soddy have discovered a so-called thorium X to be the stage through which ordinary thorium has to pass in order to produce its emanation. It is not possible to give a complete table which should, as it were, represent the genealogical tree of the various radioactive substances. Several authors have endeavoured to do so, but in a premature manner. All the affiliations are not at the present time yet perfectly known, and it will no doubt be acknowledged some day that identical states have been described under different names. 4 the disaggregation of matter and atomic energy. 
in spite of uncertainties which are not yet entirely removed, it cannot be denied that many experiments render it probable that in radioactive bodies we find ourselves witnessing veritable transformations of matter. Professor Rutherford, Professor Soddy, and several other physicists have come to regard these phenomena in the following way. A radioactive body is composed of atoms which have little stability and are able to detach themselves spontaneously from the parent substance, and at the same time to divide themselves into two essential component parts, the negative electron and its residue, the positive ion. The first named constitutes the beta, and the second the alpha rays. The emanation is certainly composed of alpha ions with a few molecules agglomerated around them. Professor Rutherford has, in fact, demonstrated that the emanation is charged with positive electricity, and this emanation may, in turn, be destroyed by giving birth to new bodies. After the loss of the atoms which are carried off by the radiation, the remainder of the body acquires new properties, but it may still be radioactive and again lose atoms. The various stages that we meet with in the evolution of the radioactive substance or of its emanation correspond to the various degrees of atomic disaggregation. Professors Rutherford and Soddy have described them clearly in the case of uranium and radium. As regards thorium, the results are less satisfactory. The evolution should continue until a stable atomic condition is finally reached, which, because of this stability, is no longer radioactive. Thus, for instance, radium would finally be transformed into helium. It is possible, by considerations analogous to those set forth above in other cases, to arrive at an idea of the total number of particles per second expelled by one gram of radium. Professor Rutherford in his most recent evaluation finds that this number approaches 2.5 times 10 to the power of 11. By calculating from the atomic weight the number of atoms probably contained in this gram of radium, and supposing each particle liberated to correspond to the destruction of one atom, it is found that one half of the radium should disappear in 1280 years, and from this we may conceive that it has not yet been possible to discover any sensible loss of weight. Sir Walter Ramsay and Professor Soddy attained a like result by endeavouring to estimate the mass of the emanation by the quantity of helium produced. If radium transforms itself in such a way that its activity does not persist throughout the ages, it loses little by little the provision of energy it had in the beginning, and its properties furnish no valid argument to oppose to the principle of the conservation of energy. To put everything right, we have only to recognize that radium possessed in the potential state at its formation a finite quantity of energy which is consumed little by little. In the same manner, a chemical system composed, for instance, of zinc and sulfuric acid, also contains in the potential state energy which, if we retard the reaction by any suitable arrangement, such as by amalgamating the zinc and by constituting with its elements a battery which we cause to act on a resistance, may be made to exhaust itself as slowly as one may desire. There can, therefore, be nothing in any way surprising in the fact that a combination which, like the atomic combination of radium, is not stable, since it disaggregates itself, is capable of spontaneously liberating energy, but what may be a little astonishing at first sight is the considerable amount of this energy. M. Curie has calculated directly, by the aid of the calorimeter, the quantity of energy liberated, measuring it entirely in the form of heat. The disengagement of heat accounted for in a grain of radium is uniform and amounts to 100 calories per hour. It must therefore be admitted that an atom of radium, in disaggregating itself, 
liberates 30,000 times more energy than a molecule of hydrogen when the latter combines with an atom of oxygen to form a molecule of water. We may ask ourselves how the atomic edifice of the active body can be constructed to contain so great a provision of energy. We will remark that such a question might be asked concerning cases known from the most remote antiquity, like that of the chemical systems, without any satisfactory answer ever being given. This failure surprises no one, for we get used to everything, even to defeat. When we come to deal with a new problem, we have really no right to show ourselves more exacting. Yet there are found persons who refuse to admit the hypothesis of the atomic disaggregation of radium because they cannot have set before them a detailed plan of that complex whole known to us as an atom. The most natural idea is perhaps the one suggested by comparison with those astronomical phenomena where our observation most readily allows us to comprehend the laws of motion. It corresponds likewise to the tendency ever present in the mind of man to compare the infinitely small with the infinitely great. The atom may be regarded as a sort of solar system in which electrons in considerable numbers gravitate round the sun formed by the positive iron. It may happen that certain of these electrons are no longer retained in their orbit by the electric attraction of the rest of the atom and may be projected from it like a small planet or comet which escapes towards the stellar spaces. The phenomena of the emission of light compels us to think that the corpuscles revolve round the nucleus with extreme velocities, or at the rate of thousands of billions of revolutions per second. It is easy to convince from this that, notwithstanding its lightness, an atom thus constituted may possess an enormous energy. Other authors imagine that the energy of the corpuscles is principally due to the extremely rapid rotations of those elements on their own axis. Lord Kelvin lately drew up on another model the plan of a radioactive atom capable of ejecting an electron with a considerable vis viva. He supposes a spherical atom, formed of concentric layers of positive and negative electricity disposed in such a way that its external action is null, and that, nevertheless, the force emanated from the center may be repellent for certain values when the electron is within it. The most prudent physicists and those most respectful to established principles may, without any scruples, admit the explanation of the radioactivity of radium by a dislocation of its molecular edifice. The matter of which it is constituted evolves from an admittedly unstable initial state to another stable one. It is, in a way, a slow allotropic transformation which takes place by means of a mechanism regarding which, in short, we have no more information than we have regarding other analogous transformations. The only astonishment we can legitimately feel is derived from the thought that we are suddenly and deeply penetrating to the very heart of things. But those persons who have a little more hardihood do not easily resist the temptation of forming daring generalizations. Thus it will occur to some that this property, already discovered in many substances where it exists in more or less striking degree, is, with differences of intensity, common to all bodies, and that we are thus confronted by a phenomenon derived from an essential quality of matter. Quite recently, Professor Rutherford has demonstrated in a fine series of experiments that the alpha particles of radium cease to ionize gases when they are made to lose their velocity, but that they do not on that account cease to exist. It may follow that many bodies emit similar particles without being easily perceived to do so, since the electric action, by which this phenomenon of radioactivity is generally manifested, would, in this case, be but very weak. 
If we thus believe radioactivity to be an absolutely general phenomenon, we find ourselves face to face with a new problem. The transformation of radioactive bodies can no longer be assimilated to allotropic transformations, since thus no final form could ever be attained, and the disaggregation would continue indefinitely up to the complete dislocation of the atom. The phenomenon might, it is true, have a duration of perhaps thousands of millions of centuries, but this duration is but a minute in the infinity of time and matters little. Our habits of mind, if we adopt such a conception, will be none the less very deeply disturbed. We shall have to abandon the idea so instinctively dear to us that matter is the most stable thing in the universe, and to admit, on the contrary, that all bodies, whatever, are a kind of explosive decomposing with extreme slowness. There is in this, whatever may have been said, nothing contrary to any of the principles on which the science of energetics rests, but an hypothesis of this nature carries with it consequences which ought in the highest degree to interest the philosopher, and we all know with what alluring boldness M. Gustave Le Bon has developed all these consequences in his work on the evolution of matter. There is hardly a physicist who does not at the present day adopt in one shape or another the ballistic hypothesis. All new facts are coordinated so happily by it that it more and more satisfies our minds, but it cannot be asserted that it forces itself on our convictions with irresistible weight. Another point of view appeared more plausible and simple at the outset, when there seemed reason to consider the energy radiated by radioactive bodies as inexhaustible. It was thought that the source of this energy was to be looked for without the atom, and this idea may perfectly well be manifested at the present day. Radium on this hypothesis must be considered as a transformer borrowing energy from the external medium and returning it in the form of radiation. It is not impossible, even, to admit that the energy which the atom of radium withdraws from the surrounding medium may serve to keep up, not only the heat emitted and its complex radiation, but also the dissociation, supposed to be endothermic, of this atom. Such seems to be the idea of M. de Bierne and also of M. Sagnac. It does not seem to accord with the experiments that this borrowed energy can be a part of the heat of the ambient medium, and, indeed, such a phenomenon would be contrary to the principle of Carnot, if we wished, though we have seen how disputable is this extension, to extend this principle to the phenomena which are produced in the very bosom of the atom. We may also address ourselves to a more noble form of energy, and ask ourselves whether we are not, for the first time, in presence of a transformation of gravitational energy. It may be singular, but it is not absurd, to suppose that the unit of mass of radium is not attached to the earth with the same intensity as an inert body. M. Sagnac has commenced some experiments, as yet unpublished, in order to study the laws of the fall of a fragment of radium. They are necessarily very delicate, and the energetic and ingenious physicist has not yet succeeded in finishing them. Let us suppose that he succeeds in demonstrating that the intensity of gravity is less for radium than for the platinum or the copper of which the pendulums used to illustrate the law of Newton are generally made. It would then be possible still to think that the laws of universal attraction are perfectly exact as regards the stars, and that ponderability is really a particular case of universal attraction, while in the case of radioactive bodies, part of the gravitational energy is transformed in the course of its evolution and appears in the form of active radiation. But for this explanation to be admitted, it would evidently need to be supported by very numerous facts. It might, no doubt, appear still more probable that the energy borrowed from the external medium by radium is one of those still unknown to us, but of which a vague instinct causes us to suspect the existence around us. 
it is indisputable moreover that the atmosphere in all directions is furrowed with active radiations those of radium may be secondary radiations reflected by a kind of resonance phenomenon certain experiments by professors elster and geitel however are not favorable on this point of view if an active body be surrounded by a radioactive envelope a screen should prevent this body from receiving any impression from outside and yet there is no diminution apparent in the activity presented by a certain quantity of radium when it is lowered to a depth of eight hundred meters underground in a region containing a notable quantity of pitchblende these negative results are on the other hand so many successes for the partisans of the explanation of radioactivity by atomic energy End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of the New Physics and its Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landis Davidson. The New Physics and its Evolution by Lucia Poicare. Chapter 10 The Ether and Matter. Section 1 the relations between the ether and matter. For some time past, it has been the more or less avowed ambition of physicists to construct with the particles of ether all possible forms of corporeal existence. But our knowledge of the inmost nature of things has hitherto seemed too limited for us to attempt such an enterprise with any chance of success. The electronic hypothesis, however, which has furnished a satisfactory image of the most curious phenomena produced in the bosom of matter, has also led to a more complete electromagnetic theory of the ether than that of Maxwell. And this twofold result has given birth to the hope of arriving by means of this hypothesis at a complete coordination of the physical world. The phenomena whose study may bring us to the very threshold of the problem are those in which the connections between matter and the ether appear clearly and in a relatively simple manner. Thus, in the phenomena of emission, ponderable matter is seen to give birth to waves which are transmitted by the ether, and by the phenomena of absorption, it is proved that these waves disappear and excite modifications in the interior of the material bodies which receive them. We here catch in operation actual reciprocal actions and reactions between the ether and matter. If we could thoroughly comprehend these actions, we should no doubt be in a position to fill up the gap which separates the two regions separately conquered by physical science. In recent years, numerous researches have supplied valuable materials which ought to be utilized by those endeavoring to construct a theory of radiation. We are perhaps still ill-informed as to the phenomena of luminescence in which undulations are produced in a complex manner, as in the case of a stick of moist phosphorus, which is luminescent in the dark, or in that of a fluorescent screen. But we are very well acquainted with emission or absorption by incandescence, where the only transformation is that of calorific into radiating energy, or vice versa. It is in this case alone that can be correctly applied the celebrated demonstration by which Kirchhoff established, by considerations borrowed from thermodynamics, the proportional relations between the power of emission and that of absorption. In treating of the measurement of temperature, I have already pointed out the experiments of Professors Lummer and Pringsheim, and the theoretical researches of Stefan and Professor Wien. We may consider that at the present day the laws of the radiation of dark bodies are tolerably well known, and in particular the manner in which each elementary radiation increases with the temperature. A few doubts, however, subsist with respect to the law of the distribution of energy in the spectrum. In the case of real and solid bodies, the results are naturally less simple than in that of dark bodies. One side of the question has been specially studied on account of its great practical interest. That is to say, the fact that the relation of the luminous energy to the total amount radiated by a body varies with the nature of this last and the knowledge of the conditions under which this relation becomes most considerable led to the discovery of incandescent lighting by gas 
in the hour Wells Bach mantle, and the substitution for the carbon thread in the electric light bulb of a filament of osmium or a small rod of magnesium, as in the Nernst lamp. Careful measurements effected by Monsieur Ferry have furnished in particular important information on the radiation of the white oxides, but the phenomena noticed have not yet found a satisfactory interpretation. Moreover, the radiation of calorific origin is here accompanied by a more or less important luminescence, and the problem becomes very complex. In the same way that, for the purpose of knowing the constitution of matter, it first occurred to us to investigate gases which appear to be molecular edifices built on a more simple and uniform plan than solids. We ought naturally to think that an examination of the conditions in which emission and absorption are produced by gaseous bodies might be eminently profitable and might perhaps reveal the mechanism by which the relations between the molecule of the ether and the molecule of matter might be established. Unfortunately, if a gas is not absolutely incapable of emitting some sort of rays by simple heat, the radiation thus produced, no doubt by reason of the slightness of the mass in play, always remains a moderate intensity. In nearly all the experiments, new energies of chemical or electrical origin come into force. On incandescence, luminescence is superposed, and the advantage which might have been expected from the simplicity of the medium vanishes through the complication of the circumstances in which the phenomenon is produced. Professor Pringsheim has succeeded in certain cases in finding the dividing line between the phenomena of luminescence and that of incandescence. Thus the former takes a predominating importance when the gas is rendered luminous by electrical discharges, and chemical transformations especially play a preponderant role in the emission of the spectrum of flames which contain a saline vapor. In all the ordinary experiments of spectrum analysis, the laws of Kirchhoff cannot therefore be considered as established, and yet the relation between emission and absorption is generally tolerably well verified. No doubt we are here in presence of a kind of resonance phenomenon. The gaseous atoms entering into vibration when solicited by the ether by a motion identical with the one they are capable of communicating to it. If we are not yet very far advanced in the study of the mechanism of the production of the spectrum, we are, on the other hand, well acquainted with its constitution. The extreme confusion which the spectra of the lines of the gases seemed to present is now, in great part at least, cleared up. Balmer gave some time since, in the case of the hydrogen spectrum, an empirical formula which enabled the rays discovered later by an eminent astronomer, Monsieur Deslanders, to be represented. But since then, both in the cases of line and band spectra, the labors of Professor Rydberg, of Monsieur Deslanders, of Professor Kaiser, and Rungi, and Monsieur Thiel, have enabled us to comprehend in their smallest detail the laws of the distribution of lines and bands. These laws are simple but somewhat singular. The radiations emitted by a gas cannot be compared to the notes to which a sonorous body gives birth, nor even to the most complicated vibrations of any elastic body. The number of vibrations of the different rays are not the successive multiples of one and the same number, and it is not a question of a fundamental radiation and its harmonics. Well, and this is an essential difference, the number of vibrations of the radiation tend towards a limit when the period diminishes infinitely instead of constantly increasing, as would be the case with the vibrations of sound. Thus the assimilation of the luminous to the elastic vibration is not correct. Once again we find that the ether does not behave like matter which obeys the ordinary laws of mechanics and every theory must take full account of these curious peculiarities which experiment reveals. Another difference, likewise very important, between the luminous and the sonorous vibrations, which also points out how little analogous can be the constitutions of the media which transmit the vibrations, appears in the phenomena of dispersion. The speed of propagation, which, as we have seen when discussing the measurement of the velocity of sound, depends very little on the musical note, is not at all the same in the case of the various radiations which can be propagated in the same substance. The index of refraction varies with the duration of the period, 
or, if you will, with the length of wave in vacuo, which is proportion to this duration, since in vacuo, the speed of propagation is entirely the same for all vibrations. Cauchy was the first to propose a theory on which other attempts have been modeled. For example, the very interesting and simple one of Brio. This last named supposed that the luminous vibration could not perceptibly drag with it the molecular material of the medium across which it is propagated, but that matter nevertheless reacts on the ether with an intensity proportional to the elongation in such a manner as tends to bring it back to its position of equilibrium. With this simple hypothesis, we can fairly well interpret the phenomena of the dispersion of light in the case of transparent substances. But far from well, as M. Carvalho has noted in some extremely careful experiments, the dispersion of the infrared spectrum and not at all the peculiarities presented by absorbent substances. M. Boussinesc arrives at almost similar results by attributing dispersion, on the other hand, to the partial dragging along of ponderable matter and to its action on the ether. By combining, in a measure as was subsequently done by M. Boussinesc, the two hypotheses, formulas can be established far better in accord with all the known facts. These facts are somewhat complex. It was at first thought that the index always varied in an inverse ratio to the wavelength, but numerous substances have been discovered which present the phenomenon of abnormal dispersion, that is to say, substances in which certain radiations are propagated, on the contrary, the more quickly the shorter their period. This is the case with gases themselves, as demonstrated, for example, by a very elegant experiment of M. Becquerel on the dispersion of the vapor of sodium. Moreover, it may happen that yet more complications may be met with, as no substance is transparent for the whole extent of the spectrum. In the case of certain radiations, the speed of propagation becomes nil, and the index shows sometimes a maximum and sometimes a minimum. All those phenomena are in close relation with those of absorption. It is perhaps the formula proposed by Helmholtz which best accounts for all these peculiarities. Helmholtz came to establish this formula by supposing that there is a kind of friction between the ether and matter, which, like that exercised on a pendulum, here produces a double effect, changing, on the one hand, the duration of this oscillation, and, on the other, gradually damping it. He further supposed that ponderable matter is acted on by elastic forces. The theory of Helmholtz has the great advantage of representing not only the phenomena of dispersion, but also, as M. Carvalho has pointed out, the laws of rotary polarization, its dispersion, and other phenomena, among them the dichroism of the rotary media discovered by M. Cotton. In the establishment of these theories, the language of ordinary optics has always been employed. The phenomena are looked upon as due to mechanical deformations or to movements governed by certain forces. The electromagnetic theory leads, as we have seen, to the employment of other images. Monsieur H. Poincaré, and after him, Helmholtz, have both proposed electromagnetic theories of dispersion. On examining things closely, it will be found that there are not, in truth, in the two ways of regarding the problem, two equivalent translations of exterior reality. The electrical theory gives us to understand much better than the mechanical one that in vacuo, the dispersion ought to be strictly null, and this absence of dispersion appears to be confirmed with extraordinary precision by astronomical observations. Thus, the observation, often repeated and at different times of the year, proves that in the case of the star Algol, the light of which takes at least four years to reach us, no sensible difference in coloration accompanies the changes in brilliance. Section 2 of Chapter 10 The Theory of Lorenz Purely mechanical considerations have therefore failed to give an entirely satisfactory interpretation of the phenomena in which even the simplest relations between matter and the ether appear. They would evidently be still more insufficient if used to explain certain effects produced on matter by light, which could not, without grave difficulties, be attributed to movement. 
for instance, the phenomena of electrification under the influence of certain radiations, or, again, chemical reactions such as photographic impressions. The problem had to be approached by another road. The electromagnetic theory was a step in advance, but it comes to a standstill, so to speak, at the moment when the ether penetrates into matter. If we wish to go deeper into the inwardness of the phenomena, we must follow, for example, Professor Lorenz or Dr. Lammer, and look with them for a mode of representation which appears, besides, to be a natural consequence of the fundamental ideas forming the basis of Hertz experiments. The moment we look upon a wave in the ether as an electromagnetic wave, a molecule which emits light ought to be considered as a kind of excitant. We are thus led to suppose that in each radiating molecule there are one or several electrified particles animated with a to-and-fro movement round their positions of equilibrium, and these particles are certainly identical with those electrons, the existence of which we have already admitted for so many other reasons. In the simplest theory, we will imagine an electron which may be displaced from its position of equilibrium in all directions, and is, in this displacement, submitted to attractions which communicate to it a vibration like a pendulum. These movements are equivalent to tiny currents, and the mobile electron, when animated with a considerable velocity, must be sensitive to the action of the magnet which modifies the form of the trajectory and the value of the period. This almost direct consequence was perceived by Lorenz, and it led him to the new idea that radiations emitted by a body ought to be modified by the action of a strong electromagnet. An experiment enabled this prevision to be verified. It was made, as is well known, as early as 1896 by Zeeman, and the discovery produced a legitimate sensation. When a flame is subjected to the action of a magnetic field, a brilliant line is decomposed in conditions more or less complex, which an attentive study, however, allows us to define. According to whether the observation is made in a plane normal to the magnetic field or in the same direction, the line transforms itself into a triplet or doublet, and the new lines are polarized rectilinearly or circularly. These are the precise phenomena which the calculation foretells. The analysis of the modifications undergone by the light supplies, moreover, valuable information on the electron itself. From the direction of the circular vibrations of the greatest frequency, we can determine the sign of the electric charge in motion, and we find it to be negative. But, further than this, from the variation of the period we can calculate the relation of the force acting on the electron to its material mass, and in addition, the relation of the charge to the mass. We then find for this relation precisely that value which we had already met with so many times. Such a coincidence cannot be fortuitous, and we have the right to believe that the electron revealed by the luminous wave which emanates from it is really the same as the one made known to us by the study of the cathode rays and of the radioactive substances. However, the elementary theory does not suffice to interpret the complications which later experiments have revealed. The physicists most qualified to affect measurements in these delicate optical questions, Monsieur Cornu, Mr. Preston, Monsieur Cotton, Messrs. Becquerel and Delandres, Monsieur Broca, Professor Michelson, and others have pointed out some remarkable peculiarities. Thus, in some cases, the number of the component rays dissociated by the magnetic field may be very considerable. The great modification brought to a radiation by the Zeeman effect may, besides, combine itself with other phenomena and alter the light in a still more complicated manner. A pencil of polarized light, as demonstrated by Sinore, Macaluso, and Corbino, undergoes in a magnetic field modifications with regard to absorption and speed of propagation. Some ingenious researches by Monsieur Becquerel and Monsieur Cotton have perfectly elucidated all these complications from an experimental point of view. It would not be impossible to link together all these phenomena without adopting the electronic hypothesis by preserving the old optical equations as modified by the terms relating to the action of the magnetic field. This has actually been done in some very remarkable work by Monsieur Voigt, but we may also, like Professor Lorenz, 
look for more general theories in which the essential image of the electrons shall be preserved and which will allow us all the facts revealed by experiment to be included. We are thus led to the supposition that there is not in the atom one vibrating electron only, but that there is to be found in it a dynamical system comprising several material points which may be subjected to varied movements. The neutral atom may therefore be considered as composed of an immovable principal portion positively charged round which move, like satellites round a planet, several negative electrons of very inferior mass. This conclusion leads us to an interpretation in agreement with that which other phenomena have already suggested. These electrons, which thus have a variable velocity, generate around themselves a transverse electromagnetic wave which is propagated with the velocity of light. For the charged particle becomes, as soon as it experiences a change of speed, the center of a radiation. Thus is explained the phenomenon of the emission of radiations. In the same way, the movement of electrons may be excited or modified by the electrical forces which exist in any pencil of light they receive and this pencil may yield up to them a part of the energy it is carrying. This is the phenomenon of absorption. Professor Lorenz has not contented himself with thus explaining all the mechanisms of the phenomena of emission and absorption. He has endeavored to rediscover, by starting with the fundamental hypothesis, the quantitative laws discovered by thermodynamics. He succeeds in showing that, agreeably to the law of Kirchhoff, the relation between the emitting and the absorbing power must be independent of the special properties of the body under observation, and he thus again meets with the laws of Planck and Wien. Unfortunately, the calculation can only be made in the case of great wavelengths, and grave difficulties exist. Thus, it cannot be very clearly explained why, by heating a body, the radiation is displaced towards the side of the short wavelengths, or, if you will, why a body becomes luminous from the moment its temperature has reached a sufficiently high degree. On the other hand, by calculating the energy of the vibrating particles, we are again led to attribute to these particles the same constitution as that of the electrons. It is in the same way possible, as Professor Lorenz has shown, to give a very satisfactory explanation of the thermoelectric phenomena by supposing that the number of liberated electrons which exist in a given metal at a given temperature has a determined value varying with each metal and is, in the case of each body, a function of the temperature. The formula obtained which is based on these hypotheses agrees completely with the classic results of Clausius and of Lord Kelvin. Finally, if we recollect that the phenomena of electric and calorific conductivity are perfectly interpreted by the hypothesis of electrons, it will no longer be possible to contest the importance of a theory which allows us to group together in one synthesis so many facts of such diverse origins. If we study the conditions under which a wave excited by an electron's variations in speed can be transmitted, they again bring us face to face and generally with the results pointed out by the ordinary electromagnetic theory. Certain peculiarities, however, are not absolutely the same. Thus, the theory of Lorenz, as well as that of Maxwell, leads us to foresee that if an insulating mass be caused to move in a magnetic field normally to its lines of force, a displacement will be produced in this mass, analogous to that of which Faraday and Maxwell admitted the existence in the dielectric of a charged condenser. But Monsieur H. Poincaré has pointed out that according as we adopt one or the other of these authors' points of view, so the value of the displacement differs. This remark is very important, for it may lead to an experiment which would enable us to make a definite choice between the two theories. To obtain the displacement estimated according to Lorenz, we must multiply the displacement calculated according to Hertz by a factor representing the relation between the difference of the specific inductive capacities of the dielectric and of a vacuum, and the first of these powers. If, therefore, we take as dielectric the air of which the specific inductive capacity is perceptibly the same as that of a vacuum, the displacement, according to the idea of Lorenz, will be null, while, on the contrary, according to Hertz, it will have a finite value. Monsieur Blondlot has made the experiment, 
he sent a current of air into a condenser placed in a magnetic field and was never able to notice the slightest trace of electrification. No displacement, therefore, is affected in the dielectric. The experiment being a negative one is evidently less convincing than one giving a positive result, but it furnishes a very powerful argument in favor of the theory of Lorenz. This theory, therefore, appears very seductive, yet it still raises objections on the part of those who oppose to it the principles of ordinary mechanics. If we consider, for instance, a radiation emitted by an electron belonging to one material body but absorbed by another electron in another body, we perceive immediately that the propagation not being instantaneous, there can be no compensation between the action and the reaction which are not simultaneous, and the principle of Newton thus seems to be attacked. In order to preserve its integrity, it has to be admitted that the movements in the two material substances are compensated by that of the ether which separates these substances. But this conception, although in tolerable agreement with the hypothesis that the ether and matter are not of different essence, involves on a closer examination suppositions hardly satisfactory as to the nature of movements in the ether. For a long time, physicists have admitted that the ether as a whole must be considered as being immovable and capable of serving, so to speak, as a support for the axis of Galileo in relation to which axis the principle of inertia is applicable. Or better still, as M. Pont-Levy has shown, they alone allow us to render obedience to the principle of causality. But if it were so, we might apparently hope by experiments in electromagnetism to obtain absolute motion and to place in evidence the translation of the earth relatively to the ether. But all the researches attempted by the most ingenious physicists toward this end have always failed, and this tends towards the idea held by many geometricians that these negative results are not due to imperfections in the experiments, but have a deep and general cause. Now Lorenz has endeavored to find the conditions in which the electromagnetic theory proposed by him might agree with the postulate of the complete impossibility of determining absolute motion. It is necessary, in order to realize this concord, to imagine that a mobile system contracts very slightly in the direction of its translation to a degree proportioned to the square of the ratio of the velocity of transport to that of light. The electrons themselves do not escape this contraction, although the observer, since he participates in the same motion, naturally cannot notice it. Lorenz supposes, besides, that all forces, whatever their origin, are affected by a translation in the same way as electromagnetic forces. Monsieur Langevin and Monsieur H. Poincaré have studied the same question and have noted with precision various delicate consequences of it. The singularity of the hypothesis which we are thus led to construct in no way constitutes an argument against the theory of Lorenz. But it has, we must acknowledge, discouraged some of the more timid partisans of this theory. Section 3 of Chapter 10, The Mass of Electrons Other conceptions, bolder still, are suggested by the results of certain interesting experiments. The electron affords us the possibility of considering inertia and mass to be no longer a fundamental notion, but a consequence of the electromagnetic phenomena. Professor J.J. J. Thompson was the first to have the clear idea that a part, at least, of the inertia of an electrified body is due to its electric charge. This idea was taken up and precisely stated by Professor Max Abraham, who for the first time was led to regard seriously the seemingly paradoxical notion of mass as a function of a velocity. Consider a small particle bearing a given electric charge, and let us suppose that this particle moves through the ether. It is, as we know, equivalent to a current proportional to its velocity, and it therefore creates a magnetic field, the intensity of which is likewise proportional to its velocity, to set it in motion. Therefore, there must be communicated to it over and above the expenditure corresponding to the acquisition of its ordinary kinetic energy, a quantity of energy proportional to the square of its velocity. Everything therefore takes place as if, by the fact of electrification, its capacity for kinetic energy and its material mass had been increased by a certain constant quantity. 
To the ordinary mass may be added, if you will, an electromagnetic mass. This is the state of things, so long as the speed of the translation of the particle is not very great. But they are no longer quite the same when this particle is animated with the movement whose rapidity becomes comparable to that with which light is propagated. The magnetic field created is then no longer a field in repose, but its energy depends in a complicated manner on the velocity, and the apparent increase in the mass of the particle itself becomes a function of the velocity. More than this, this increase may not be the same for the same velocity, but varies according to whether the acceleration is parallel with or perpendicular to the direction of this velocity. In other words, there seems to be a longitudinal and a transversal mass which need not be the same. All these results would persist even if the material mass were very small relatively to the electromagnetic mass, and the electron possesses some inertia even if its ordinary mass becomes slighter and slighter. The apparent mass, it can be easily shown, increases indefinitely when the velocity with which the electrified particle is animated tends towards the velocity of light, and thus the work necessary to communicate such a velocity to an electron would be infinite. It is in consequence impossible that the speed of an electron in relation to the ether can ever exceed or even permanently attain to the 300,000 kilometers per second. All the facts thus predicted by the theory are confirmed by experiment. There is no known process which permits the direct measurements of the mass of an electron, but it is possible, as we have seen, to measure simultaneously its velocity and the relation of the electric charge to its mass. In the case of the cathode rays emitted by radium, these measurements are particularly interesting for the reason that the rays, which compose a pencil of cathode rays, are animated by very different speeds, as is shown by the size of the stain produced on a photographic plate by a pencil of them, at first very constricted and subsequently dispersed by the action of an electric or magnetic field. Professor Kaufman has effected some very careful experiments by a method he terms the method of crossed spectra, which consists in superposing the deviations produced by a magnetic and electric field respectively acting in directions at right angles one to another. He has thus enabled by working in vacuo to register the very different velocities which starting in the case of certain rays from about seven-tenths of the velocity of light attain in other cases to ninety-five hundredths of it. It is thus noted that the ratio of charge to mass, which for ordinary speeds is constant and equal to that already found by so many experiments, diminishes slowly at first and then very rapidly when the velocity of the ray increases and approaches that of light. If we represent this variation by a curve, the shape of this curve inclines us to think that the ratio tends towards zero when the velocity tends towards that of light. All the earlier experiments have led us to consider that the electric charge was the same for all electrons, and it can hardly be conceived that this charge can vary with the velocity. For in order that the relation of which one of the terms remains fixed, should vary, the other term necessarily cannot remain constant. The experiments of Professor Kaufman, therefore, confirm the provisions of Max Abraham's theory. The mass depends on the velocity and increases indefinitely in proportion as this velocity approaches that of light. These experiments, moreover, allow the numerical results of the calculation to be compared with the values measured. This very satisfactory comparison shows that the apparent total mass is sensibly equal to the electromagnetic mass. The material mass of the electron is therefore nil, and the whole of its mass is electromagnetic. Thus the electron must be looked upon as a simple electric charge devoid of matter. Previous examination has led us to attribute to it a mass a thousand times less than that of the atom of hydrogen, and a more attentive study shows that this mass was fictitious. The electromagnetic phenomena, which are produced when the electron is set in motion or a change effected in its velocity, simply have the effect, as it were, of simulating inertia, and it is the inertia due to the charge which has caused us to be thus diluted. The electron is therefore simply a small volume determined at a point in the ether and possessing special properties. This point is propagated with a velocity which cannot exceed that of light. 
When this velocity is constant, the electron creates around it in its passage an electric and a magnetic field. Round this electrified center there exists a kind of wake, which follows it through the ether and does not become modified so long as the velocity remains invariable. If other electrons follow the first within a wire, their passage along the wire will be what is called an electric current. When the electron is subjected to an acceleration, a transverse wave is produced, and an electromagnetic radiation is generated, of which the character may naturally change with the manner in which the speed varies. If the electron has a sufficiently rapid periodical movement, this wave is a light wave. Well, if the electron stops suddenly, a kind of pulsation is transmitted through the ether, and thus we obtain Rontgen rays. Section 4 of Chapter 10 New Views on the Constitution of the Ether and of Matter New and valuable information is thus afforded us regarding the properties of the ether. But will this enable us to construct a material representation of this medium which fills the universe? and so to solve a problem which has baffled, as we have seen, the prolonged efforts of our predecessors? Certain scholars seem to have cherished this hope. Dr. Lammer in particular, as we have seen, has proposed a most ingenious image, but one which is manifestly insufficient. The present tendency of physicists rather tends to the opposite view, since they consider matter as a very complex object regarding which we wrongly imagine ourselves to be well informed because we are so much accustomed to it, and its singular properties end by seeming natural to us. But in all probability, the ether is, in its objective reality, much more simple and has a better right to be considered as fundamental. We cannot, therefore, without being very illogical, define the ether by material properties, and it is useless labor, condemned beforehand to sterility, to endeavor to determine it by other qualities than those of which experiment gives us direct and exact knowledge. The ether is defined when we know in all its points, and in magnitude and in direction, the two fields, electric and magnetic, which may exist in it. These two fields may vary. We speak from habit of a movement propagated in the ether, but the phenomenon within the reach of experiment is the propagation of these variations. Since the electrons, considered as a modification of the ether, symmetrically distributed around a point, perfectly counterfeit that inertia which is the fundamental property of matter, it becomes very tempting to suppose that matter itself is composed of a more or less complex assemblage of electrified centers in motion. This complexity is, in general, very great as is demonstrated by the examination of the luminous spectra produced by the atoms, and it is precisely because of the compensations produced between the different movements, the essential properties of matter, the law of the conservation of inertia, for example, are not contrary to the hypothesis. The forces of cohesion thus would be due to the mutual attractions which occur in electric and magnetic fields produced in the interior of bodies and it is even conceivable that there may be produced, under the influence of these actions, a tendency to determine orientation, that is to say that a reason can be seen why matter may be crystallized. All the experiments affected on the conductivity of gases or metals and on the radiations of active bodies have induced us to regard the atom as being constituted by a positively charged center having practically the same magnitude as the atom itself, round which the electrons gravitate, and it might evidently be supposed that this positive center itself preserves the fundamental characteristics of matter, and that it is the electrons alone which no longer possess any but electromagnetic mass. We have but little information concerning these positive particles, though they are met with in an isolated condition, as we have seen, in the canal rays or in the X-rays. It has not hitherto been possible to study them so successfully as the electrons themselves but that their magnitude causes them to produce considerable perturbations in the bodies on which they fall is manifest by the secondary emissions which complicate and mask the primitive phenomenon. There are, however, strong reasons for thinking that these positive centers are not simple. Thus Professor Stark attributes to them, with experiments in proof of his opinion, the emission of the spectra of the rays in Geisler tubes, and the complexity of the spectrum discloses the complexity of the center. Besides, 
Certain peculiarities in the conductivity of metal cannot be explained without a supposition of this kind, so that the atom, deprived of the cathode corpuscle, would be still liable to decomposition into elements analogous to electrons and positively charged. Consequently, nothing prevents us supposing that this center likewise simulates inertia by its electromagnetic properties and is but a condition localized in the ether. However this may be, the edifice thus constructed, being composed of electrons in periodical motion, necessarily grows old. The electrons become subject to accelerations which produce a radiation towards the exterior of the atom, and certain of them may leave the body, while the primitive stability is, in the end, no longer assured, and a new arrangement tends to be formed. Matter thus seems to us to undergo those transformations of which the radioactive bodies have given us such remarkable examples. We have already had in fragments these views on the constitution of matter. A deeper study of the electron thus enables us to take up a position from which we obtain a sharp, clear, and comprehensive grasp of the whole and a glimpse of the indefinite horizons. It would be advantageous, however, in order to strengthen this position, that a few objections which still menace it should be removed. The instability of the electron is not yet sufficiently demonstrated. How is it that its charge does not waste itself away, and what bonds assure the permanence of its constitution? On the other hand, the phenomena of gravitation remain a mystery. Lorenz has endeavored to build up a theory in which he explains attraction by supposing that two charges of similar sign repel each other in a slightly less degree than that in which two charges equal but of contrary sign attract each other, the difference being, however, according to the calculation, much too small to be directly observed. He has also sought to explain gravitation by connecting it with the pressures which may be produced on bodies by the vibratory movements which form very penetrating rays. Recently, M. Sutherland has imagined that attraction is due to the difference of action in the convection currents produced by the positive and negative corpuscles which constitute the atoms of the stars and are carried along by the astronomical motions. But these hypotheses remain rather vague and many authors think, like M. Langevin, that gravitation must result from some mode of activity of the ether totally different from the electromagnetic mode. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of the New Physics and Its Evolution this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Physics and Its Evolution by Lucien Poincaré. Chapter 11 The Future of Physics. It would doubtless be exceedingly rash and certainly very presumptuous to seek to predict the future which may be reserved for physics. The role of profit is not a scientific one, and the most firmly established provisions of today may be overthrown by the reality of tomorrow. Nevertheless, the physicist does not shun an extrapolation of some little scope when it is not too far from the realms of experiment. The knowledge of the evolution accomplished of late years authorizes a few suppositions as to the direction in which progress may continue. The reader who has deigned to follow me in the rapid excursion we have just made through the domain of the science of nature will doubtless bring back with him from his short journey the general impression that the ancient limits to which the classic treatises still delight in restricting the diverse chapters of physics are trampled down in all directions. The fine straight roads traced out by the masters of the last century and enlarged and leveled by the labor of such numbers of workmen are now joined together by a crowd of small paths which furrow the fields of physics. It is not only because they cover regions as yet little explored where discoveries are more abundant and more easy that these cross-cuts are so frequent, but also because a higher hope guides the seekers who engage in these new routes. In spite of the repeated failures which have followed the numerous attempts of past times, the idea has not been abandoned of one day conquering the supreme principle which must command the whole of physics. Some physicists, no doubt, think such a synthesis to be impossible of realization, and that nature is infinitely complex, 
but notwithstanding all the reserves they may make from the philosophical point of view as to the legitimacy of the process they do not hesitate to construct general hypotheses which in default of complete mental satisfaction at least furnish them with a highly convenient means of grouping an immense number of facts till then scattered abroad their error if error there be is beneficial for it is one of those that kant would have classed among the fruitful illusions which engender the indefinite progress of science and lead to great and important coordinations it is naturally by the study of the relations existing between phenomena apparently of very different orders that there can be any hope of reaching the goal and it is this which justifies the peculiar interest accorded to researches affected in the debatable land between domains hitherto considered as separate among all the theories lately proposed that of the ions has taken a preponderant place ill understood at first by some appearing somewhat singular and in any case useless to others it met at its inception in france at least with only very moderate favour Today things have greatly changed, and those even who ignored it have been seduced by the curious way in which it adapts itself to the interpretation of the most recent experiments on very different subjects. A very natural reaction has set in, and I might almost say that a question of fashion has led to some exaggerations. The electron has conquered physics, and many adore the new idol rather blindly. Certainly we can only bow before a hypothesis which enables us to group in the same synthesis all the discoveries on electric discharges and on radioactive substances, and which leads to a satisfactory theory of optics and of electricity, while by the intermediary of radiating heat it seems likely to embrace shortly the principles of thermodynamics also. Certainly one must admire the power of a creed which penetrates also into the domain of mechanics and furnishes a simple representation of the essential properties of matter but it is right not to lose sight of the fact that an image may be a well-founded appearance but may not be capable of being exactly superposed on the objective reality the conception of the atom of electricity the foundation of the material atoms evidently enables us to penetrate further into nature's secrets than our predecessors but we must not be satisfied with words and the mystery is not solved when, by a legitimate artifice, the difficulty has simply been thrust further back. We have transferred to an element ever smaller and smaller those physical qualities which in antiquity were attributed to the whole of a substance, and then we shifted them later to those chemical atoms which, united together, constitute this whole. Today we pass them on to the electrons which compose these atoms. The indivisible is thus rendered, in a way, smaller and smaller, but we are still unacquainted with what its substance may be. The notion of an electric charge, which we substitute for that of a material mass, will permit phenomena to be united which we thought separate, but it cannot be considered a definite explanation, or as the term at which science must stop. It is probable, however, that for a few years still, physics will not travel beyond it. The present hypothesis suffices for grouping known facts, and it will doubtless enable many more to be foreseen, while new successes will further increase its possessions. Then the day will arrive when, like all those which have shown before it, this seductive hypothesis will lead to more errors than discoveries. It will, however, have been improved, and it will have become a very vast and a very complete edifice, which some will not willingly abandon. For those who have made to themselves a comfortable dwelling place on the ruins of ancient monuments are often too loath to leave it. In that day the searchers who were in the van of the march after truth will be caught up and even passed by others who will have followed a longer but perhaps surer road. We also have seen at work those prudent physicists who dreaded too daring creeds, and who sought only to collect all the documentary evidence possible, or only took for their guide a few principles which were to them a simple generalization of facts established by experiments and we have been able to prove that they also were effecting good and highly useful work. Neither the former nor the latter, however, carry out their work in an isolated way, and it should be noted that most of the remarkable results of these last years are due to physicists who have known how to combine their efforts and to direct their activity towards a common object. While perhaps it may not be useless to observe, also, that progress has been in proportion to the material resources of our laboratories. It is probable that in the future, as in the past, 
the greatest discoveries, those which will suddenly reveal totally unknown regions and open up entirely new horizons, will be made by a few scholars of genius who will carry on their patient labor in solitary meditation and who, in order to verify their boldest conceptions, will no doubt content themselves with the most simple and least costly experimental apparatus. Yet for their discoveries to yield their full harvest, for the domain to be systematically worked and desirable results obtained, there will be more and more required the association of willing minds, the solidarity of intelligent scholars, and it will be also necessary for these last to have at their disposal the most delicate as well as the most powerful instruments. These are conditions paramount at the present day for continuous progress in experimental science. If, as has already happened, unfortunately, in the history of science, these conditions are not complied with, if the freedoms of the workers are trammeled, their unity disturbed, and if material facilities are too parsimoniously afforded them, evolution at present so rapid may be retarded, and those retrogressions which, by the by, have been known in all evolutions may occur, although even then hope in the future would not be abolished forever. There are no limits to progress, and the field of our investigations has no boundaries. Evolution will continue with invincible force. What we today call the unknowable will retreat further and further before science, which will never stay her onward march. Thus physics will give greater and increasing satisfaction to the mind by furnishing new interpretations of phenomena, but it will accomplish, for the whole of society, more valuable work still, by rendering, by the improvements it suggests, life every day more easy and more agreeable, and by providing mankind with weapons against the hostile forces of nature. End of chapter 11 End of the New Physics and its Evolution by Lucien Poincaré